Hello, my name is Dr. Rees. I'm making this video to introduce you to our website, BehavioralHealth2000.com. This is a company which is dedicated to education and psychiatry, and it contains a number of features. The most important, perhaps, is an e-book which is entitled The New Psychiatry. Now, this book is not a regular book. It is a updated learning tool that will constantly be refreshed and be up to date with the newest scientific findings in the field of neurobiology and psychiatry. The ebook should be studied carefully and slowly because we have added a number of links which will direct you to the primary research articles that are the basis of the findings that are discussed and really form the foundation of psychiatry in the 21st century. Now, in addition to the ebook, we will also have some other resources, such as lectures. Uh, we have lectures on mindfulness and its effect on the brain. We will have lectures on dualism, mind-body dualism, that appears to be quite pervasive in psychiatry to its detriment. And we will discuss ways to counteract and to analyze this uh, mind-body dualism and come to a perhaps better understanding of the basis of psychiatric practice and research. Now, taking off from the theme of dualism, many psychiatrists abdicate their responsibility to deal with many medical problems, in particular medical problems that they contribute, in fact, by prescribing certain psychiatric medications which have severe and often lethal side effects in the long term. So there will be a lecture on the metabolic syndrome. Now, the metabolic syndrome is well known in internal medicine and it's a common feature in psychiatry. However, research indicates that psychiatrists pay little attention to this and seem quite oblivious to their contribution to the syndrome in those populations which already are predisposed to suffer from this condition, which has been shown to shorten the lifespan of patients with severe mental illness by perhaps 10 to 20 years. Further lectures will expand on the notion of metabolic syndrome and study its effect on brain function. There are exciting recent findings which show that insulin resistance does not just occur in the periphery in the body, but also in the brain and may have direct impact on functions of the hippocampus, memory, and other brain circuitry. Other uh, lectures will deal with psychopharmacology and the foundations of psychopharmacology. Now, psychiatry, research and education, particularly education, is really poorly founded. The foundations are not taught to psychiatric residents. For example, little attention is paid to how the brain produces the phenomenon of consciousness. And all psychiatric disorders in one way or another are really disturbances of consciousness. So we will spend quite a bit of time in looking at research findings which dispel the notion that consciousness is a different ontological category that is resistant to scientific investigation. There's great resistance to having consciousness be explainable because it undercuts a lot of long-held notions in psychiatry such as the biopsychosocial model. Biopsychosocial is really a very poor term and indicates a certain laziness of thought. Anything that happens that we perceive or experience happens in the brain. And it's incumbent upon psychiatry to show that in the, in the brain this is really happening and how it's happening and how brain circuitry is impacted by these functions. We will also 
digress in a sense from purely psychiatric considerations and sidetrack into fields that are adjacent to psychiatry and are often not taught but are highly relevant, for example, to social sciences and social psychology. Did you know that if you take a walk in a green pasture or around the green Stanford campus and you go into the MRI scanner and have your metabolic activity evaluated in the brain, that a critical part of the brain that has been implicated in depression is calmed down and is functioning in a more appropriate way. So the environment talks to the brain. In fact, anything that we perceive talks to the brain. And we need to track these things and utilize them as appropriate for psychiatry. For example, psychotherapy does not happen in a vacuum, but psychotherapy has been shown to change brain circuitry and impact brain function. So in the end, you may have detected already that our bias is quite materialistic and non-dualistic. We believe that that is the future of psychiatry and that non-dualism, I think, should imply psychiatrists being responsible, empirically responsible, for the findings in the field, be educated in a broad sense in psychology, social psychology, biochemistry, and of course all the medical sciences that contribute to the brain. Neuroscience is in a period of explosive growth. We can estimate that in a two or three years time period, the knowledge base will have doubled. Residents now in psychiatry need to learn everything that already has been found and when they're done with their training, they need to double up their effort and learn everything that's been found since they started the training. Quite a Herculean task, of course. However, without clear understanding of all the brain functions involved in psychiatry, a psychiatrist trained in the current paradigm is like John Searle's famous metaphor of the man in the Chinese room. This is a person who does not read Mandarin, but he's being fed Chinese characters through a slot in the room. He has a huge book of rules which allow him to decode the Chinese characters and compose an answer. However, he did not understand anything that was written because he has no semantic knowledge of the language. However, to the superficial observer, he looks completely organized and it appears as though he composes intelligent responses. Now a psychiatrist who does not know the foundations of neuroscience and how they impact the field is like this man in the Chinese room and it's not surprising that a psychiatrist functioning in this way will become burnt out, will become routinized and not really serve the best interest of his patients. We're looking forward to your feedback and any suggestions you might have for themes to discuss, for lectures to produce uh, on the web. And you can email us at www.behavioralhealth2000.com and we will consider your ideas and look forward to your feedback. I hope you enjoy the ebook and look forward to your questions.